Simply having wonderful Christmas time. Simply having a wonderful Christmas time. Tater tots. Play the slots. Simply having a wonderful Christmas time. Da da da. Da da da. Simply having wonderful Christmas time. I say for Christmas, delete that song and delete Paul McCartney. Rest in peace, Paul McCartney. Christmas is the time when we gather around the hearth to roast our nuts and our chests and to debate our family members as we watch Jingle All the Way as to the esoteric significance of Arnold. It's also the time when we hear the endless dumb arguments that Christmas is pagan. <clears throat> I myself once made this dumb argument when I was a dumb dumb. I have left the dumb many years ago. And so instead of the dumb, I want to initiate you into the truth about St. Nicholas Yes, St. Nicholas himself, let the, let the woke light shine upon you right here. Get some of that woke light. Come bathe in that. Get some of that. Let that woke light burn away the dross of dumb. There we go. There we go. And when we understand that Santa Claus was real, this is him. See, this is the real Santa Claus. He's even got kind of a Christmassy vestment thing going on here. St. Nicholas was the wonder worker of Myra, the archbishop. And he's known as a saint who was pleasing to God. He is most famous for not just miracles, but the punching of Arius at the Council of Nicaea. So he's actually crucial to the doctrine of the deity of Christ. And everybody tries to explain away, oh, he didn't really do it. Oh, he didn't really mean it. Yes, he did. And we don't have to justify and explain away our aggressive actions at times to all heretics now why do i bring this up well i'm going to put a link to a great article below that really dispels a lot of the dumb arguments about christmas and every year we have to hear how it's pagan and we have to hear how easter is astart ash ishtar blah 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 which is all total nonsense as we pointed out last year easter is pascha Pascha is Passover because Jesus fulfills Passover. If you read Exodus 12, if you read the Gospel of John, you see very clearly how the typology is fulfilled in Christ as the Lamb. When we consider Christmas, uh, as you'll see in the excellent article below, it's dated from the fact of how uh, Zechariah, who is the priest who offers the incense in Luke 1, 8 through 11, right? This is during Yom Kippur. So we learn that he offers his uh, priestly offering at that time period. And then from there, we can date the birth of John the Baptist. And from the birth of John the Baptist, the dating is then uh, calculated for December 25th. And this comes actually from the church fathers. It comes from the church fathers early on in the first three, four, five centuries. So it has nothing to do at all with soul invictus. The fact that something happens on a day has nothing to do with why other people do things on that day. If your birthday is December the 25th, does that mean that you were mystically born uh, because of soul invictus? No, that's ridiculous. So neither does the Christian reasoning for doing Christmas as it's done have anything to do with Sol Invictus. In fact, Sol Invictus is a post-Christian, uh, post-2nd century Roman celebration. So it literally has absolutely nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with Saturnalia uh, any more than Passover has anything to do with Astart or Ostare or any of these later Germanic holidays of, of what uh, Passover or of what Easter is supposed to be. So... When we understand that, we understand that this, this evangelical tendency to try to explain any kind of symbolism or any kind of liturgy away is, uh, first of all, without basis, and second of all, it's just ignorance of history. Thirdly, it's not uh, actually biblical. And fourth, 
when we read the church fathers, we understand that there is tradition. So there is a legitimate usage of tradition. The Jews themselves had liturgical traditions that were not all bad. In fact, in Matthew 23, Jesus actually says that the traditions can be good, right? As he rebukes the false traditions, because he mentions the scribes and Pharisees sitting in the seat of Moses. That's a tradition. There's nothing in the Old Testament that talks about a seat of Moses. But Jesus refers to this tradition, this tradition of authority amongst the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, as he then goes on to rebuke the false traditions, which are made up to replace the word of God. Now, we know that the early church did not just invent and make up the worship service as they went along. They actually described for us in Justin Martyr, uh, in Irenaeus, and many of these early uh, fathers of the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth centuries. And we even still in the Orthodox Church today do the liturgy of St. Basil, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, the exact same as it was back in the 4th and 5th centuries. So we know that we worship the exact same way that early church did, and we know that the deity of Christ wasn't something that was invented at the Council of Nicaea. This is another constant stupid myth and and easily debunkable claim that evangelicals, Seventh-day Adventists, and other sectarian cults make about the early church. Again, you can go and read very easily St. Clement, St. Ignatius, St. Irenaeus, St. Justin Martyr, Ambrose, all saints that were living at or before or right after the Council of Nicaea. And what you'll find is that they all teach the exact same doctrines and theology that we teach still today in Orthodox Church. So again, St. Nicholas is a bishop of the Orthodox Church. St. Nicholas and many other saints in the early church had liturgies. In fact, there was a great controversy in the second century as to when to date Easter. There was no controversy about whether there was Easter in liturgy, but the date was the, the controversy was actually about the dating of it. So that's about at about 180, 190. And there was a controversy between East and West in different groups. They were called the Quarto Decimanarians that that uh, tried to come up with a, a date for Easter that was out of accord with the rest of the church. So the point is that the early church in, inherited its worship tradition, its liturgy from the synagogue and from the temple services. It wasn't something that was just made up. And this is what almost all Protestants don't understand. In fact, when I was Protestant, one of the things that really got me to questioning uh, Protestantism as a whole was the issue of the canon of scripture, how it came to be, how it was in fact the bishops of this of this early church in the, in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth centuries that made the decision as to what books would go into the canon of scripture. It was a long process that took many centuries. And it didn't just involve the ideas of different traditions within different bishoprics and sees where, where the traditions were passed down and different textual traditions were passed down. It also involved the liturgy, the, the form and structure of the worship, which we can all go and see, included things like the real presence of Christ. It included the feast days of the saints, right? So this is from the earliest days of the church. It's all very easy to verify this. And when we see that, we won't be misled into these kind of overly simplified evangelical ideas that certain puritanical claims are true about Christmas or that it's just this invented thing that Al Alexander Hislop is usually who everybody goes to. Well, this is nonsense. The fact that Alexander Hislop finds a similarity between this image and that image does not prove that the symbolism itself is inherently evil or that it comes from, quote, paganism. For example, if you've ever seen a cross in a circle, that is known as the Gnostic cross, right? Now, would we argue that because Gnostics use the cross, that the cross is therefore of Gnostic origin? No, that would be absurd, right? If we think about the lion, right? The Bible uses the lion of Satan, right? Satan prowls around like a, a lion seeking whom he, may, whom he may devour. And it also compares Jesus to the lion as the, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So symbols can be mo uh, polyvalent. They can have different meanings in different contexts. They don't always have one simple singular usage it depends on their context and that's what a lot of the evangelical sort of oversimplified look at uh, things like oh that's a pagan tradition when you do that oh you, you have a holiday that's a pagan tradition now some traditions do come out of the world of paganism that are harmless they don't have any inherent religious significance in the sense of invoking deities or demons or something like this uh, a good example of this is if you read the early canons of the church, they'll say things like you, you cannot, if you're a Christian, uh, attend the shows, the amusements. Why is that? Is that because it's inherently evil to go to a play? No, it's because the plays of that time required uh, adoration and some sort of uh, 
obeisance to the pagan deities and gods. It had nothing to do with the play itself being evil. That would be Gnostic. That would be superstitious. So we have to admit that, that it's God himself who established liturgy. And you can actually read the Williams and Anstall book uh, about how the Orthodox Church is actually a perfect successor to the liturgy of the synagogue and the temple. And that's why the earliest church fathers uh, worship in that way. Jesus himself worshiped liturgically. He went to his local synagogue and worshiped in an orderly liturgical fashion. He didn't worship with rock bands. They didn't make it up as they went along. They didn't flop around the floor like dogs, like Benny Hinn, barking and laughing and acting like morons. They, they worshiped in a very orderly way. And that's because God, all the way back to Leviticus and prior to that, lays down in Leviticus actually consistent patterns of liturgical worship. And the Orthodox Church, after the fulfillment of Christ coming to fulfill those things, continues that tradition because that is his church. So we don't want to be uh, uh, confused over really sort of basic misunderstandings, which again, I know a lot of people are sincere. I was raised evangelical. I was under the impression for a long time that uh, something like Christmas is somehow inherently pagan because it happens to be on or near the same day of some other pagan festival. That's a fallacy, right? Just because something happens at the same time, it doesn't mean it's a genetic fallacy. It doesn't mean that they come from the same origin. The Again, the writers of the early church were laying down these patterns of worship. Uh, and sometimes these traditions do arise in different communities. For example, Easter was earlier than Christmas. Christmas arises in, in Alexandria around 200 AD. So it's true that the church can, can bring about traditions and can institute traditions that are not, that are not harmful, but actually positive. And that's because that's always been how God's people operated, right? It's the same principle behind the canons of the councils. The canons are authoritative and can be enforced by the church and interpreted by the church because the church has authority from Christ to do that, uh, right? So we know that the apostles and their successors, they rule the church like princes, right? Like bishops are supposed to do. They're the episcopate and there is a hierarchy. And that's all mentioned in the New Testament itself. That's why Paul, for example, at Ephesus, he says to Timothy in the letters to Timothy, he says, I put you, I laid hands on you, Timothy, and you choose men after you, right, who are faithful to lay hands on them to pass on the deposit of faith. So there's a succession clearly in the book of Timothy, in the book of Acts, when Judas dies, they, they elect another successor to his episkopos in the Greek, to his episcopate. So the bishopric has always been the feature of Christianity and one of our great bishops is, of course, Santa Claus himself, the Orthodox Saint Nicholas, and has nothing to do with paganism. You say, oh, that's an icon that's pagan. No, no, no. Did you, did you notice that the temple in the Old Testament, why it's full of iconography, early synagogues in the first century, full of iconography, as you see here in these pictures. So <clears throat> iconography is not pagan any more than the Ark of the Covenant was pagan. Uh, holy days are not pagan any more than Passover is pagan. It makes no sense because, again, Easter is Pascha, right? And so it makes perfect sense to honor the day of the birth of Christ, just like we honor the birth of John the Baptist, the forerunner, right? We, we, we honor him. Obviously, we're going to honor the incarnation of God himself, the second person of the Godhead, the Logos, taking on human nature, becoming incarnate and the meaning of this day the meaning of all this is that the incarnation is what is the basis for how we are saved from the power of death and satan and that's because our human nature which had been damaged and destroyed and corrupted through the fall is restored in the second adam jesus himself right so the second person of the godhead the logos takes on human nature he's a divine person not a human person a divine person with a fully human nature and through his life, he offers himself to Christ or to, to God the Father as an offering. And that offering is what destroys the power of death because he baits the devil. And, and, and when, when he descended into Hades, he actually was invited into Satan's realm, into the realm of death, right? So God himself was, was taken into the realm of death and through that action destroyed the power of death and thereby brought resurrection to all of mankind, to all of human nature. That's the orthodox doctrine of the harrowing of Hades. And thus it is up to us to repent, to, to uh, become one in Christ, to join Christ, to join the orthodox church. That's the only true church. And thereby to achieve theosis. Theosis is nothing more than attaining to the resurrection, attaining to immortality, attaining to eternal life, attaining to the divine life, uh, to obtain the Holy Spirit, 
as Paul says, and that's where the sacraments of Christ come into play is that Christ gave those sacraments to the church so that we could participate in him, right? It's not just an external thing. It's an external and an internal thing, right? So uh, we're not Gnostics. We do believe in the inherent goodness of matter and the created realm. And so the bodies of the saints become like icons themselves. We become icons when we are transfigured into the image of Christ, who is the image of the Father. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you. Hopefully it, we can clear up some of the basics here. Again, if you have doubts about this, just go read the uh, uh, right, the very, there, there's not a lot. Read the writings of Irenaeus, of St. Ignatius, St. Clement, St. Ambrose, St. Cyprian. And then look at the count, the canons of Nicaea. There's only 20 or so of these canons. And you'll see that they teach the same thing in the Nicene Creed and in the canons of Nicaea that the church fathers prior to Nicaea taught. Merry Christmas. If you like this analysis, be sure to click subscribe and give me a thumbs up down below. Also, be sure to check out Jay's analysis uh, and definitely click the bell down below to be sure you get the updates.